Greetings. I'm the impoverished player. You get what I pay for. Now, you may be asking yourself, what can a homely, lowly, currently unemployed role-playing enthusiast like myself do for you, the gaming community? Well, how about an in-depth review of what the World Wide Web has to offer in the way of free, affordable, massive multiple online role-playing games? In my search for an inexpensive means to play massive multiple games online, I found that Korea has the most to offer, namely Seoul, Southern Korea, where nearly a decade ago, back in 1999, a fledgling gaming company by the name of Intizen Co. Ltd. set up shop. A full five years after they'd opened for business, Intizen released their first online title, Gonzu Online, around January of 2004. This brought them enough funding and recognition worldwide to allow them to branch out into other areas, such as China, Europe, Japan, Taiwan, Vietnam, and the... United States, Canada, Mexico, Panama, Haiti, Jamaica, Peru. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Maybe it wasn't that much recognition, but still, it was enough for the company to realize that maybe naming themselves after a centuries-old philosophy for tea and life wasn't in the best interest of the gaming community. So they changed it. Within the same year that Gonzo Online was released, Intizen became Endors. And, dependent upon where you live, that's either Endors Corporation, Endors Entertainment, or Endors Interactive. So what does any of this have to do with my current review? Well, seeing as how Gonzu Online was released overseas and I can't really afford proper translation, tutoring in the language, or plane tickets, I guess doing a review on it's kinda out of the question. Hold on a second. Looks like Endor Interactive released about three titles for its Western audience to enjoy. Let's have a look. There's Atlantica Online, Wonder King Online, and Luminary Rise of the Gunzu. Okay, I can work with these games. Let's see what they have for demos first, though. Okay, side-scrolling, two-dimensional, chibi-formed, anime-esque, sequence platformer, side-scrolling, massive multiple role-playing game. Huh. Let's see what else they have. Given us a third dimension to work with. <laughs> I guess that means that the next one. This is completely different! And I don't just mean different for an Endors game, no, this is completely different for massive multiple online role-playing. You get to control a small army! Where'd my toothpick go? This harkens back to a few console role-playing games, like Konami's Gensu Sikuden series, or more recently, Square Enix Last Remnant. Come on. If mass unit micromanagement is your cup of Intizen, you're gonna love this game. <sighs> Although, this is also a good game for the history or geography buffs out there. The world is set in, well, the world. An alternate history world to be exact. 
which is actually the old world, which is actually our world. You see, somewhere along time's twisty curvature, the lost city of Atlantis discovered a life-altering material they called Ori Harukan, which was powered by four crystals. Being the greedy power mongers that they were, the Atlanteans hoarded the Ori Harukan to themselves and eventually depleted the power crystals. This led them out into the world to seek more, and brought about what could be called some of our nicer desolate wastelands for the current day and age. But without a means to control the Ori Harukan, all of Atlantis simply blinked out of being. I guess, amidst the list of things that the Ori Harukan is capable of, aside from turning everything it interacts with into a deranged, monstrous shell of its former self, is the manipulation of time and space. I mean, sure, the geography bears a striking resemblance to our own, and I suppose it's as accurate as it can be given the conversion. I just find it amusing that I can run from Tokyo, Japan to Vancouver, British Columbia in a single day on a western-based route without having to change my boots. The major inconsistencies lie within which era civilization is currently based. It does kind of add to the entire steampunk light aspect that they're going for, and it also allows you to barter for goods and services with several well-known historical figures. Figures such as Julius Caesar, Vendi, Vitti, Vici, Dr. David Livingston, Searching for a person is my specialty. And Charlie Chaplin. And these... Things... Which can be found near Detroit City... As... Vending Machines. <laughs> Let's have a look at character customization. Now, as with most online role-playing games, you'll find that... What? Right. Well, not a bot. Where was I? Character customization. Now, as with most online role-playing games, you'll find that there isn't really much to customize with your character. I mean, it's not surprising given that most role-playing games have large, clunky, mismatched armor that covers up everything anyway, but it's kind of nice to change things like your armor color, facial features, hair color, and... An afro. You, you can have an afro. You can't change your skin color, you can't change your body proportions, but you can have an afro. An afro that, might I add, just gets covered up by your helmet anyway. I mean, an afro. It's just a whole new level of chronological inconsistency right there. Who you are is heavily dictated by what kind of equipment you carry, though. Uh, your weapons can range anywhere from the classic medieval molds of swords and shields, staves, bows, and long-handled stabby things, as well as more modern weaponry like rifles, cannons, heavy metal guitars... And is that a chainsaw? You're telling me that on this time-skewered alternate history Earth, I could be running around right off the bat with... Oh, wait. It says in the fine print that you have to have at least gotten one character up to level 100 before you can play through with the chainsaw. Replay value! Most of your character customization comes in the form of your battle arrangement, namely who you choose to let into your little band of wrong writers and how you rank and file them. As you progress through the game, you'll be able to hire additional mercenaries to stand with you on the 3x3 grid of battle, for a total of 9 characters altogether, including yourself. Your choices for additional mercenaries are nearly quadruple that of your original character, though, as there are various specialized classes, including, but not limited to, inventors... Did you call me? Sailors... 
Are you afraid of dying? Which is... Hi? And... This is... Sparta. The controls are fairly basic for an MMORPG. It even gives you the cliché pointy-clicky sword so you can select which opponent to attack. Once you get into combat, though, it gets a little bit tricky. So far as I've found, you have to actually point and click on either the ally or enemy that you want to use an ability on. Given the slanted angle of the screen and the fact that some monsters in the background can be smaller than the ones in the foreground, let's just say that I found it easier to rotate the camera and then pan out as far as it can possibly go in order to see all the targets on the screen. There's also the erratic special moves jerky camera motion that goes on and makes it difficult to manage your next move within 30 seconds, but thankfully this feature can be turned off. Of course, it wouldn't be much of a multiplayer experience if you weren't able to engage others in bouts of sequential stratagem, and this game thrives on its multiplayer community. You can join up to two other players to adventure with for a total of 27 mercenaries on your side of the field, which also accounts for about 27 opponents on the other side of the field, but there are plenty of benefits to adventuring in a group, such as increased experience gain, community crafting, and higher grade quests. And if you join a guild and happen to capture a city, you'll be able to affect its commerce and warfare. Now, you're probably sick of me yammering on and on about the game at this point and rubbing your knuckles in anticipation of a price tag. Well, I hate to disappoint my viewers, but it's free! It's the special features that cost extra. Basic conversion is 5 American dollars for 500 non-refundable G-Coins. Bargains don't really begin for you until you're spending about 50 to 100 American dollars. Spending $50 nets you an additional $5 worth of coins on top of what you purchased, while spending $100 offers an additional $20 worth of coins. Your average shop item costs, amusingly enough, anywhere from 499 G-Coins to upwards of 3,899 G-Coins. This will afford you such things as combat scrolls, stacks of material, beneficial license that expire after a set number of days, mystery packages with 1 in 17 odds that you'll get the item you actually want, and t-shirts! Aside from a few technical and graphic annoyances, and the fact that you don't really have to be at your computer unless you're in combat, I urge everyone to give this game a go. Crafting items and getting from point A to point B can be tedious, but if you're in that much of a hurry, you're probably just going to fork over $5 for time-saving materials anyway. This is a unique game with a time-altered history line and a very supportive community interface. And best of all, it won't cost you a thing. Now if you'll excuse me for a moment, I have to... Finally, now I can move on to... Where did that kettle come from? <laughs> <laughs>